Good morning, and welcome to Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Today is Sunday, December 10th, 2023. This morning, we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent with a message from Pastor Yost entitled, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? We Allow Ourselves to Be Amazed. This message is based upon Psalms 126 and the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 56 through 66. After Elizabeth gives birth, her neighbors and family celebrate with her. When it comes time to name the child, Zachariah affirms the name given by the angel and by Elizabeth. In that moment of affirming promise, Zach Zachariah's speech is restored. Everyone was filled with awe. How often do you allow yourselves to be amazed? Wonder what is all around us. Can we recognize it? As we learn to rejoice in a weary world, can we live in a way that allows amazement and wonder to surprise us often? In Psalm 126, those who expect to reap tears are granted a surprise. Shouts of joy. Amazement is a balm for the weary. Psalm 126, a pilgrim song. When the Lord's change Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful shouts. It was even said at the time among the nation, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are overjoyed. Lord, change our circumstances for the better, like dry streams in the desert waste. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. When the time came for Elizabeth to have her child, she gave birth to a boy. Her neighbors and relatives celebrated with her because they had heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy. On the eighth day, it came time to circumcise the child. They wanted to name him Zachariah because he was his father's name. But his mother replied, No, his name will be John. They said to her, None of your relatives have that name. Then they began to gesturing to his father to see what he wanted to call him. After asking for a tablet, he surprised everyone by writing, His name is John. At that moment, Zachariah was able to speak again, and he began praising God. Her neighbors were filled with awe, and everyone throughout the Judean highlands talked about what they had happened. All who heard about this considered it carefully. They said, What then will this child be? Indeed, the Lord's power was with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God. You are the God who holds our voices, sustains them, and determines when we need to sit back and be silent. May our time together be one that bears fruit of your liberating love. Amen. So, last Sunday evening... I went to a four hour concert. And so the next day, typical stuff, woke up with a limited voice. And then through various other events this week, I've slowly had a voice and slowly not had a voice, which makes this a little interesting. Um, and then thanks to technical issues, I'm now recording this sermon from my house uh, with the lovely trying to have it blur because uh, the basement is a little chaotic and I wasn't expecting to have to do this anytime soon. And so We'll see if my voice will make it through the whole recording. Um, here's to hoping, right? 
I, I do find it interesting that our passage today is when Zachariah gets his voice back and the whole week I've been struggling to keep my voice. So two weeks ago, when we last heard about Zachariah, he had lost his voice because he doubted God and doubted that God was going to be able to help him have a baby um, when him and Elizabeth were at an old age. And, and maybe not even doubted because he, he was more concerned about the how. How could this even be possible? How was God going to do this? So while it's only been a few verses and two weeks for us, it's been 40 weeks for him living day to day without his voice. And given my experiences this week, I could see how it would be easy for him to brood in his limitations. Since Zechariah was a Jewish man living in Roman-occupied Israel, I wonder if travel became complicated by his inability to communicate for most of a year. I wonder how much of his priestly duties expected him to talk to people. I wonder about all the times that he wanted to comfort Elizabeth but couldn't use his words to do so and had to think of different ways to do this. I wonder how many times he was so grateful that Mary was there for the last two trimesters of Elizabeth's pregnancy, making it so that she, that Elizabeth had the support that she needed and the person and a person to talk to. At first glance, it looks like instead of brooding, Zachariah chose to pay attention over the 40 weeks to notice his son grow in his Elizabeth's body belly to silently pray every time he worked at the temple to notice how people treat each other. Because of, instead of griping and complaining, like I envision the one guy, I don't remember his name, but it's from the first Hocus Pocus when he rips open uh, his mouth after being dead for who knows how long and was very angry. Um, so after 40 long weeks of not being able to speak, Zachariah's first words are the name of his son, confirming that they're breaking tradition and allowing his wife to choose. And then from there, praising God. And being the priest that he was, I wonder if his words sounded more like Psalm 126. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful shouts. I wonder how much of Zachariah's experience for those 40 weeks was like the experiences of Trevor Powers. He's a singer-songwriter that I recently found out about who lost his voice, but had his faith and understanding of being alone challenged along the journey of regaining his voice. You see, back in 2021, he had a bad reaction to medication, which led to acid destroying his vocal cords. And early on, each day felt like a mini death as his reliance on, on technology to communicate with his wife and friends constantly reminded him that he couldn't sing anymore. But then he slowly became, uh, well, it slowly became a spiritual experience for him. He says, this experience with my voice, it, it taught me something. I used to think God watches people suffer, but this showed me that God actually suffers with you. These new experiences led to the album Heaven is a Junkyard, and he releases his music under the name Youth Lagoon. And no, I haven't really listened to much of the album before, but I, my understanding is that he recorded and wrote this album as his voice slowly came back, and which gave him a venue to process his positive and negative experiences all at the same time. And he even strategically recorded some verses on days when he didn't have much of a voice and other verses on days when he did. So I would say that Zachariah spent 40 weeks noticing and brooding. In Alice Walker's The Color Purple, while two characters are walking through a field talking about God, Shug states, I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. People think pleasing God is all God cares about, but any fool living in the world can see it always trying to please us back. It always making little surprises and springing them on us when we least expect it. For Shug, noticing the little surprises from God helps us love God in return. And how much more is it is that true for us with other people? 
And the more we notice in other people and notice and proclaim in the world around us, awe and wonder become infectious. Our awe isn't meant to be contained within ourselves, but it pours out of us. So this is the image drawn by Reverend Garrity in our devotional for this week. And in it, we can see Zachariah's newfound awe is pouring out of his mouth and amongst the people. It spreads through the crowd, and they all end up with various expressions of awe and wonder on their face. And even as it goes beyond here, Reverend Garrity has it transforming into doves, which even leave the original frame of the image. She writes, When we allow ourselves to be amazed, we might be surprised what wonder can turn into. So even just noticing the small things in others can completely change how we interact with the world. And so much of my job as a teacher is noticing and calling out the great aspects of my kids. So much of my job as a teacher is noticing and calling out the great aspects of my kids so that they can find the success that they need. I think of a time last year, one of my students transferred towards the beginning of the year and she was really struggling with adapting to the level of rigor that we have at City, especially in mathematics. And I had to keep reminding her that she came from a school where she was top tier, top one, two, or three. And that's still who she was. And so by the end of the year, she thanked me because I helped her find great success. She ended up doing pretty well. And I had to remind her that I didn't do much. I just kept reminding her who she was and noticing what she was capable of doing when she couldn't notice it herself. So thinking back at our image, these doves flowing through the crowd as symbols of peace. And the crowd is a group of people living in an occupied territory. I can imagine how the hope of a better tomorrow helps transform the lived experiences and bring hope of peace for those that are in the West Bank and in Gaza and throughout all of Israel. I recently have been listening to the podcast Unapologetic, a third narrative, ran by two Arab-Israeli Palestinian people. And through their stories, perspectives, and wisdom, I can now see how their collective imagination for a better world as citizens living under occupation probably brings hope to those around them. Hope that a better world is in fact possible. Additionally, awe and wonder can help improve our health. In the beginning of this year, the New York Times ran an article about Dr. Dyke, Dr. Dr. Keltner's research as a psychologist at the University of California, Berkeley. In it, he's quoted as saying, awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your understanding of the world. In his research, Dr. Keltner found that awe activates the vagal nerves, clusters of neurons in the spinal cord that regulate various bodily functions and slows our heart rate, relieves digestion and deepens breathing. And he leaves us with four ways to practice all. First, we practice all by paying attention, like Shug from The Color Purple invites us to do. Or earlier in the series, we talked about Ross Gay and his thoughts around inciting joy. And while he also reminds us that delight, which requires paying attention, is an act of resistance. 
It helps us reorder the way the world in a way that directly resists grind culture and so much more. Second, we can practice awe by focusing on the moral beauty of others, or as Fred Rogers said, look for the helpers. That includes looking for the good in others and also intentionally reading about those that are out there that are doing the good. Third, we practice awe when we practice mindfulness. And for many people, that sounds intimidating. The idea of being alone with our thoughts is the least desirable outcome for many. But it really can be just a moment. A moment where we allow our curiosity to flow as we slow down, breathe deep, and reflect. And fourth, we practice awe when we choose the unfamiliar path. Take a different route home. Walk a different path for your dog or just go on a different walk in your neighborhood. Go to a different restaurant to cultivate a different experience. Those of you that typically join us live, either in Zoom or in the room, you may have noticed that so many of our personal journey of faith stories come from, from moments like these where we pause and notice and see what a neighbor is up to when we allow canceled plans to lead us to a restaurant we haven't been to before and begin to dream possibilities of where we could be, go to next. That's why I cherish that moment of our service so much. When we slow down and take the time to be in awe, we grow in our connection to one another and with God. We remind ourselves and others that a better world is possible. And so I'm going to close with the poem in the devotional for this week by Reverend Sarah Speed. It's entitled All the Way to Joy. We could play hard and fast, not, any, not let anything touch us at all. Keep composure, have all the answers, or we could crack ourselves open and let everything in. We could feel everything, every touch, every marvel. We could stand ga ga gaping. We could stand gaping at the beauty of the world, mouths wide open, because sometimes a mouth wide open is the best gratitude. We could laugh so loudly that the whole restaurant looks and air on the side of Goofy whenever possible. We could put our defenses down. We could grow soft. We could choose awe. We could take her by the arm. We could let her lead us all the way to joy. May God be with you this week. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If the people at Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church may be of service to you, please email us at mvpumcbaltimore at gmail.com. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you until we can meet again. God be with you.